Good afternoon. My name is Keith Willoughby, and it's my pleasure to be the Dean of the Edwards School of Business. And I want to welcome you today to the 13th presentation of the Gordon and Maureen Haddock Entrepreneurial Speaker Series. As we gather here today, we acknowledge that we meet on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. We pay our respect to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship with one another. Although it is cold outside, I warmly welcome you to today's festivities. I am pleased to see so many in attendance today, faculty, staff, students at the Edwards School of Business, our university guests, our dignitaries, um, our friends, our families, our guest speaker and family, as well as individuals who are here representing with the uh, Get a Bigger Wagon competition. I do want to introduce Gordon and Maureen Haddock. Gordon and Maureen are great friends of the Edwards School of Business. Both are alumni of the University of Saskatchewan. Gordon graduated with a Bachelor of Commerce degree. Maureen is a graduate of the College of Education. I've used this quote many times with the Haddocks and I feel inspired to use it again. It's been said that they who give money give much. They who give time give more, but they who give of themselves give all. And truly the Haddocks have given of themselves in profound ways to the entrepreneurial community in Saskatoon, to the University of Saskatchewan, and to the Edwards School of Business. The Haddocks are true entrepreneurs. They developed the Gordon and Maureen Haddock Entrepreneurial Speaker Series beginning, beginning in 2007. Every year since that, we've had the great fortune to hear from a variety of entrepreneurs who have shared their personal and insightful stories with us. It has been said that the best way to predict the future is to create it. Thank you to our young entrepreneurs, many of you who are here in attendance today, to your families. Thank you to today's stellar guest speaker. All of you are creating a successful today by imagining the future of tomorrow. I would now like to invite to the podium Gordon Haddock to come forward and introduce, to today, introduce today's special guest, Ms. Janet Danielson. Gordon. I have to say. <laughs> How are we doing there, Terry? We got a good mic on. Everybody hear me? Oh, there we go. Even I can hear myself. Um, thanks, everyone, for taking the time to come to our 13th annual speaker series. And I'd like to thank a few people who traveled a long way to get here, especially on this cold day. Uh, first, the Blakeleys, which I see back there. They come from Consul, which is in the south uh, west corner, and if you go about another 50 miles, you'd be singing the Star Spangled Banner, I'm sure. Um, secondly, Cindy Lowe, who is the president of the Saskatchewan Teachers Association, was coming up with 14 students from her young business club, but due to the weather, uh, Cindy couldn't make it, and that's too bad. It would have been great to have them here. We've got Joe Taylor over there, who is the Aboriginal Youth Entrepreneur Program Coordinator. Say that fast three times, Joe. And he's, uh, he too had uh, some transportation problems because the buses won't come in this cold weather. But uh, finally, from Saskatoon, we have Steve and Sheila Erickson, who have an entrepreneurial section at their Roadways Learning Studio. So that's just an acknowledgement. Thanks for coming through that awful, awful weather for coming to our speaker series. The goal of the speaker series is twofold. One, to expose students and the general public um, to entrepreneurism and to hear speakers who have been successful entrepreneurs and to hear about their journey. The second, and the dean knows this well, is to get entrepreneurism as a major in the Edwards School of Business. And we've been working on it uh, for 30 years approximately, six deans. And it, it, we're getting closer. It is now a core class for all students. We're patient. We're entrepreneurs. <laughs> uh, about 35 years ago, I was having a cool beverage in a local tavern in Kindersley, where we had our second drugstore. And one thing led to another, and you know how it goes. And by the end of the evening, I had purchased not one, but two unicycles from some other patrons in the bar. 
I then attempted over the next six months to learn how to ride them. And uh, for those of you unfamiliar with unicycles, they are the most ridiculous, impossible thing to learn, which if you use your imagination, uh, involves a lot of pain. And after months of trying, I had zero, and I mean zero skills. I couldn't even ride three feet. I thought this was the hardest thing I'd ever tried until I had my first free Pilates lesson. <laughs> like the unicycles, Pilates looks easy when those who have the skills showed their talents. But just let me say that my unicycle experience fell to second place. What an eye-opening workout. Our guest speaker, a proud Edwards grad, had not only the dedication to learn Pilates and gain her Pilates certification, but levered that knowledge into a thriving business. She literally took it from her basement to an amazing 9,000 square foot facility where she has expanded her core Pilates business into an integrated, individualized approach to health and wellness. Her business model includes everything from Pilates, nutrition, chiropractic care to massage, and much, much more. It doesn't take a lot of imagination to see the potential of this new model of health and fitness. And I look forward to hearing where Lead Pilates is going and what the future holds for her company. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce the dream builder of Lead Pilates, Jana Danielson. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you everybody for coming. My sister's in the front row here with my parents and my husband, and we always used to joke and kind of make fun of my mom about how she would cry at the drop of a hat. But I am slowly becoming my mother. <laughs> and a couple more minutes up here, Gordon, you would have had me. Um, so I am thrilled to be able to spend time with you this afternoon. Honored and humbled are words that I have been using a lot over the past week as I've been telling people about my opportunity here with you this afternoon. I was probably at the first or second um, event here, and it was, it was amazing. And sometimes I do these things where if I'm at an event, I'll plant a seed in my head and I'll say, you know, one day I'm going to be doing that. Or, and this was one of those things where I decided that one day I would create a story that would be worthy enough to share and maybe inspire. And today is that day, so thank you for braving the frigid temperatures and coming. It's really cool to be here, you guys, because you're going to find out a little bit more about me and how I actually spent 10 years of my work career here on campus. But um, over the next half an hour, I want to tell you kind of what my story is and where it all began. Uh, Jason and I watched the movie called The Upside with Kevin Hart. Some of you have maybe seen that. It's a couple years old. Anyways. Um, when you heard my introduction, it's kind of like how Upside starts, where you see the end of the movie, and you get a glimpse, and then it rewinds, and you see how Kevin Hart exactly got to that spot. And so this is kind of where it all began for me. Some of these photos are dark because they're pictures of very old pictures, but I grew up in a farm family in Norquay, Saskatchewan. That is my sister and my brother up there. Um, I am a Christmas Eve baby, so my mom would always make cakes based on the theme of the season. So there were my birthday cakes. And this uh, picture in the middle here is, of course, those of you that have grown up in small towns know that if you don't participate in any, you know, anything and everything, you don't have enough people to play volleyball or basketball, <laughs> and, right? And so um, we, we are uh, Ukrainian heritage, so we Ukrainian danced. And that picture in the middle, I'm going to get you to pay attention to it, because it's going to have some significance later on in um, my presentation. So I love this quote that I found from Desmond Tutu. You don't choose your family. They are God's gift to you as, as you are to them. And I think growing up in an entrepreneurial family, 
when that's really all you know, you take things for granted until you are no longer in those four walls under that roof with those people. And so this is a picture of our family. We actually went to Hawaii in 1989. Look at that hair. <laughs> Crazy backcombed, hairsprayed hair. Um, and it was the first time that we were on an airplane together. And so it was a really awesome opportunity. But um, my dad started farming and shortly, you know, in the 80s, you guys know that farming wasn't awesome in the 80s. Interest rates were through the roof. And so what my family did is they became very good at diversifying and looking for other opportunities. So my childhood or our childhood was spent um, in the early 80s spending time actually in a little town called Burlington, Colorado, because my dad and uncle found some farmland to purchase in, in Colorado. And so we would finish, get our report cards in elementary school, and we would get packed up. And, and at that time, um, I believe it was Ronald Reagan that was the president. So as a Canadian farming in the US, you had to actually take your farm equipment down there and, and be responsible for you know, taking off the crop. And so there was this big caravan of semis and combines loaded and, and away we went and we would have our little s stops every single year. And one of the reasons why I'm probably a big Denver Broncos fan, but when you grow up and you don't realize that there were decisions made because they needed to be made. Um, but yet we were sheltered from that. Like we never, we never knew that there were, you know, the power, SAS power was almost gonna shut off the power. Like we didn't know that kind of stuff, my brother and sister and I. And so you start hearing, you know, we would hear like my family talk and you would get these little stories and you would try and think back like, how did I not know that? But I think as an entrepreneur, you, you know that there are going to be those rainy days and you know that there's something inside of you that just doesn't allow you to quit. And so there was the farm in the States and then there were three independent um, chemical and fertilizer dealerships. And so that was, that was, you know, that was our upbringing. We were, you know, you, you pitched in. I remember there was a, young, a family in our town whose young daughter got diagnosed with a brain tumor. And within about 48 hours, there were like 20 ladies at our house and my mom was planning a progi supper, like a fundraiser for this family because they had to take their daughter to, the ch uh, to Toronto to the sick children's hospital. And so that's, those are, that's what I saw. I also had moments where my dad decided it would be a really good idea for my brother and sister and I to do some hard work. And we had probably about 100 spruce trees that surrounded our uh, house. <laughs> And keep in mind, th there was, there was sp spray. My dad had products at his business that could have easily killed the weeds around <laughs> each spruce tree. But that one summer, the three of us had to go out and we pulled weeds around every single spruce tree. And about five trees in, it dawned on me that, you know what, dad has, <laughs> dad has something much easier to get rid of all of these weeds. Um, but you know what, the three of us went out there and we would complain about my brother taking breaks and he'd go into the ba for bathroom breaks and come out like two hours later. But those were the things that now, when I think back, there were lessons in there, okay? Um, my dad took actually our three boys uh, just outside of Campsack where we have, they have a cabin at Madge Lake and they did some fencing. And every year when we drive back to the lake, even though it's like five or six years later, the boys are so proud They'll obviously remember that fence we did with grandpa and we grumbled a little bit, but so that's, that was basically my upbringing. Um, this is, you guys look at, look at my mom. Those of you that remember, do you remember Another World and Felicia Gallant? Yeah. And she would have, I loved when my mom wore her hair like that with her raccoon coat, but here's something really cool that, that happened to me in 1982. So my dad came home from a rec board meeting and he said, you know, Jana, would you want to, and I was like nine at this point. Um, would you, do you think you'd want to run for Carnival Queen? And so Carnival, every, those of you again that are small town people know that you have a winter fest and there's like a hockey tournament and like the skating carnival and there's a dance and things like that and no one had ever been in elementary school and ran for Carnival Queen. And he said, listen, this is how it works. Like we have to raise money for the, for the skating rink and you will get 10% of whatever you raise. 
And I was like, okay, so I'm starting to do math, and I'm thinking, okay, yeah, so we, we did it. And in our town, when you ran for Carnival Queen, you either ran for the schools or you ran for, um, like, I think it was maybe the town administration. Anyways, you kind of had the support of those two entities. And so that night, um, I skated in the carnival, and then I quickly got changed into my velvet skirt and kind of... I, I, as I was going through old pictures, I wore very judge-like clothes back then. I always had some <laughs> sort of little tie around my neck. I noticed a bit of a theme there. Anyways, um, there was big controversy because, of course, my teachers in elementary school wanted to do fundraising for me, but yet I wasn't the school representative. And so at the end of the day, I won. I beat Melody Dredge. I don't know where she is now. <laughs> and... I got, yeah, I got a check for $300. So in 1982, when you're nine years old and you get a check for $300, I thought that was pretty awesome. And so, um, you know, this experience, as maybe minor as it seemed, really, I mean, it felt good to give back. It felt good to be a part of something bigger than was, than, than was me. And, you know, the $300 was, was a pretty cool um, reward. Now... Okay, now lots of things just happened between 1982 and 1985, or 1995, actually. So I, probably towards the end of grade 11, I started thinking, okay, what am I going to be doing? I want to move away. And so I thought, okay, my family's in the ag business. I should probably do something that's ag-related. And so I went to our town library, and I was looking for a book on wheat midge. It must have been a year, a spring, where there was lots of wheat midge. So the librarian... Um, Mrs. Anaka, she said, we have nothing like that. I'll have to order it from Yorkton. So she ordered me a book on wheat midge. And I went and I got it, and I really wanted to impress my dad. So I left my binders out, and I left this wheat midge book on top. And he came home, and I could hear, he said, whose book is this? And I was like, well, that's my book. I'm going to be an ag rep for, a com one, so for one of the big companies. That's what I'm going to do with my life. And he said to me, Jana, you hate digging potatoes <laughs> and getting dirt under your nails. How are you possibly ever going to succeed at being an ag rep? And he said, listen, this is the family business. The family business is always going to be here if you want to be a part of it. You need to go and do something that really inspires you. And I know this probably isn't it. So it's here if you want, but... And I was like, thank God. <laughs> so, because I looked through the few first few pages and I was like, I, this does not interest me at all. So anyways, I went and took the book back to the library. Um, and I decided to come and make my go at it here at the College of Commerce, as it was called back then. Um, I was excited to come to Saskatoon. I was excited to go to Midtown Plaza and shop which, with part of my student loan. I was putting things away on layaway and making sure I had enough for my rent, and then I would take the rest and go get my new jackets and things like that. But um, it's an eye-opener, and for those students in the room, you know if you've just kind of maybe gone through your first term as a university student, it is shocking how humbling the first year of classes can be because my first assignment was English. We had to take a first-year English class when I went through uh, my undergrad degree. And I probably was maybe like a mid-90 grade 12 English mark, and I handed in my first assignment, super confident. It was on Gulliver's Travels. You can see how an imp it impacted me. Um, and I got it back, and I got a 36. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, oh, my gosh. Maybe I am going to have to go home and learn about Wheat Midge because this <laughs> business school is not, is not for me. Um, so I went and I th we had an opportunity to rewrite, so I rewrote and I got it back, you guys, and I got a 29. I got worse in my rewrite, and so I really started questioning, am I smart enough to be in this, at this school? And what I realized, which I hope some of you are realizing really quickly, is that your professors really are lifelines for you. And I went to my professor and we sat down and he talked about the construction of the essay and the critical thinking that was lacking and all these kinds of things. And so um, that was one of my lessons really early on, probably within four weeks of being here, is that, you know, the people standing in front of you in your class, um, yes, they've put in tons of years and time and, and effort to learn and become experts in their area, but they also, teachers tend to have huge hearts and they want you to, to succeed. So just make sure that if that's you right now, um, there's a huge resource that, if, if untapped, um, is a really big missed opportunity. 
So I did graduate, um, and I graduated with an HR major, and how I came to pick your major, and those of you who are picking majors tomorrow, right, some of you that are in your second year, so you know how I picked my major? After my first year, my mom said, you know, Jana, like technology is going to be really big, and I think a woman in technology could be very successful, and I was like, yeah, mom, you're right. So, but I didn't take the right computer classes to major in computer science. So that summer after my first year, I registered and took some computer science classes. Anyways, it was a three-week class by week, by day two, not week two, day two. I was like, okay, <laughs> this is worse than wheat midge. And I don't <laughs> think, <laughs> I don't think I can spend a career and be happy doing this. There's lots of people that can be, but this is not for me. And I ended up in Wendy Wignes's office on Friday of that first week in tears saying that I didn't know what I was going to do here, what I was going to major in. And my question to her was, what is the complete opposite of computer science? What <laughs> major would that be? <laughs> and she said, well, it would be something like human re resource management because it's very, and I was like, you know, say no more. That is what I'm going to work towards. And that's why I majored in HR. And sometimes, you know what, it's what you don't want that leads you in the direction of maybe what you should be considering. So that was the night of the Commerce graduation in 1995. And... Um, it was an awesome way to celebrate. Now, remember that Ukrainian dancing picture that I had you just kind of make note of? So in that Ukrainian dancing picture was my future husband, and I did not know that. Because back in the day, small town, you never dated a boy from your own town, right? You had to go and date imports. You didn't want to. <laughs> so um, there is, and Jason's here today. So. Um, there is Jason and I in our grad 1991 um, photo. We ended up getting married. That's the picture of us. We both did master's degrees after our initial undergrad degree. So as soon as we finished our undergrad, we got married. Jason was accepted to do his master's degree. I went and worked to, to support him. He had some scholarship money too. And then when I came back to work at the U of S, that's when I went ahead and did, did my MBA. So that's kind of how this all started. My path or my career, here are some of the great places that I have been able to learn from and really who have molded me to what I am doing today. So back in 1995, there weren't a lot of human resource jobs. And I ended up working in retail. There was a t uh, store in Midtown Plaza called Winter Co. It was Winter Co. in the winter and Summer Co. in the summer, right? Yep. Oh, so I'm seeing some nods. Yeah. You might even have your Draymar jackets, right? <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Maybe I sold it to you. I don't know. Um, but, I mean, one of the things that is really important is whether it's Winter Co., whether it is your, you know, after school job or your dream career, it has to be done with, Det like determination, hard work, and passion, because that's how you get noticed. And when I was working at Winter Co., hanging up jackets after people, and it wasn't, I kept thinking, this is not what I went to school for. But there was always that thought in the back of my mind that um, the skills that I was learning and the people that I was meeting, I may have met my next employer walking through the door, helping him or her with a jacket. And that's always the mindset that I try to come to something with is that even like today, maybe you begrudgingly came in this wretchedly cold weather, but there might be a connection with someone here that might change the direction of your life. You just never ever know when that happens. Um, I worked for Russell Marcou at N Yankee Transfer. That was my first, what I'm going to say, real HR job. I was a driver services rep. So really, I was like the lifeline for those drivers all over North America. And what I realized really quickly was they needed that connection back home more than the Department of Transportation records and things like that that I had to make sure were always um, on par with the legislation. Um, again, it, was, it comes down to the people and your ability to want to help and make a difference in their lives. I got an opportunity to, be, to come back to campus, and as soon as I had that opportunity, I, I jumped at it. And so I was here for 10 years, you guys. It was an awesome 10 years. I started in student affairs and services, doing first year orientation, parent orientation, um, and I see some of my former colleagues, which is so awesome that you guys are here. And from that, I really, again, um, going from the private sector into a public sector organization where you can sometimes feel like you're lost or that you're just a little piece of a puzzle, 
it really, I found a lot of success at the university because I still treated my job like it was the most important job at this school. And that, again, every time I picked up the phone and it was a parent that was worried about his or her child or, um, you know, because we were in room 60 and we had Aboriginal student services and students for service or disability services and international student services, it gave me such a really unique perspective on what was going on um, in the lives of students. And so I had the opportunity while I was working to come back and do my MBA and I jumped at it. So my very first boss, Dr. Vera Pezer, was amazing to be able to allow me to have time off to do that. I got a chance to be a sessional lecturer in the College of Engineering. And actually, you know how they say things come full circle? So Trista's here today. Trista is like literally the right hand of my body at LEAD. And um, she was actually one of my students in, she, was, she is an engineer. And um, she was one of my students when I was sessional lecturing. And th th those engineers back then used to call the class Speak and Spell. And I knew that they called it Speak and Spell, but I, every single time I walked out into that classroom, I walked in like it was the most important thing they were ever going to do. Because as an engineer, you could do all your amazing calculations to how to keep that bridge up or how to, you know, pitch a new building. But if you couldn't clearly communicate to your clients, to the key stakeholders, why you maybe needed money or it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. And so all those experiences just kept layering and layering and layering. And the entrepreneurial bug was starting to kind of, you know, wear its ugly head a little bit at me. But we were in the middle of having our kids and um, I, I loved every day that I was here. And so we moved from student services over to the College of Law where I did the finance and administration there and got a chance to be in, you know, in a college and see the dynamics of the faculty and the staff and then the larger university. And so I have such fond memories of this place that um, you know, even though you leave here, at some point each of you will be leaving, you still leave a piece of you here on this campus. Um, while I was doing, while I was in my mat leaves, okay, and our f so Tyler is our son, our oldest son, and he's actually here today. He's a first year um, Edwards student, so it's good to have him here. Um, he was born in, the be in January 2001, and if those of you that were having babies around that time know that maternity leave switched from six months to one year. So if you had a baby on December 31st of 2000, you had six months off. But if you had your baby the next day, you had a year off. And I remember that New Year's, I was like, Jason, I want nothing with spice or nothing with salt. I just want to drink some water and have some crackers. And anyways... But when I realized what a year was, I was like, holy Hannah, this is a long time to not be amongst your people and, you know, the, those people, the work family that means so much to you. And so while I was in the middle of raising kids, there were two awesome companies called Discovery Toys and Usborne Books. And it was uh, like the, a, a multi-level company type thing, right? But within like months, I was the top seller in Canada in both of these. And I thought, this is kind of cool because I get to go out and meet other moms. Jason was my packer, so he would pack all the books and the toys into these Rubbermaid totes and he would load my vehicle and unload my vehicle. And that was what, and you know, to this day, I still meet people that I've been involved with in those companies. And you know what, you guys, the, the counselor that now works with me at LEAD, um, Jen and I met through Discovery Toys. And it was amazing, like 20 years later, when I had an opening to join my team, it was a no-brainer because her and I had worked together earlier on. Um, as I was finishing my last mat leave, I remember I said that entrepreneurial bug was starting to like tap me on the shoulder a little bit more and more intently. I was recruited over to Koenig and Associates as part of a succession plan and I was super excited because when you are a part of a succession plan, it means that one day you're going to be able to own part of that company. And I know a lot of you probably here know Peggy, we didn't end up, that plan didn't end up happening, and she still is running a successful HR consulting business today. But what that job taught me was that I could take the jump and try it on my own. And that's what I did. And so in 2008, I started lead management consulting, um, the fall of 2008. And that was exactly the same fall that I started teaching Pilates out of my house. So if you ever watch Shark Tank, sometimes they, they always talk about what, what problem are you solving? And when I started uh, teaching Pilates, I was solving a problem that I lived with for probably about 10 years. And in my early 20s, I looked really healthy, but I had so many undiagnosed digestive issues. I went through doctors and specialists and so many tests, and it was just never 
I could never figure out what it was. I remember actually being in room 60, getting ready to go to a meeting, and my stomach hurting so badly that I leaned over my desk and grabbed and pulled my desk into my body because I just was in such pain. And, and so I found Pilates, and it absolutely changed my life. I wanted to learn more about my body. I wanted to know why, when I went into my first mat class, why all these amazing people who were probably 20 or 30 years older than me could move their bodies in ways and actually breathe in ways that, my, uh, that I could not. And I became addicted to feeling good. I didn't have to, within about six months, I was off all my medication. And I still didn't understand why, but I didn't care. I wasn't telling anybody because I thought I'd have to knock on wood because what if I told somebody that I thought it was Pilates and then my pain came back. So coming to Pilates was very organic for me. And it was because of what it did in my body that I wanted to share with everybody. So these, I mean, they're, they're much, much bigger now. They're 15, uh, or 14, 16, and 19. But, you know, when you have kids, I think gone are the days where women have to think, okay, do I, can I have both or do I have to choose one or the other? And you don't have to. You can be a mom and you can be a success in your corporate job. You can be a success in your volunteer life. You can be a success as a small business owner. Um, it takes some time and you need to have important people around you because like I told my boys when they were young is that, you know, like a teeter-totter, you need to have two friends on that teeter-totter that weigh a little bit different because it's fun when you can go up and down, right? Imagine having a friend that weighed the same as you when you're sitting on the teeter-totter looking at each other and thinking, well, this is sucky because we're not doing anything fun here. That's kind of, that was my way of explaining to them sometimes mom is busy at work, sometimes dad's busy at work. We, you know, we're always going to be around to make sure that you're well cared for. Um, but the cool thing is that these guys, uh, we were, we were farm, Jason Farm probably till maybe four or five years ago we sold the land. But what was super cool about a conversation that we had at the dinner table one night, Jason was in Norquay harvesting. And so Tommy's our youngest one, and then Will's our middle, and then of course there's time. We were sitting around the table eating, and Will said to Tommy, what are you going to be when you grow up? And Tommy says, I'm going to be an NHL goalie and an NFL running back. <laughs> right. And you're right, you're never supposed to squash their dreams. And I'm like, that is awesome. That's awesome, buddy. And Will says, to, no, Tyler says to him, because Ty's like the accountant of the family, right? He kind of keeps the rules. He says, Tommy, you can't be an NHL goalie and an NFL running back because the seasons overlap. You have to pick one or the other. And that little guy was probably like seven years old. He looked Tyler right in the eyes and he said, I don't have to pick. Mom didn't pick. Dad didn't pick. You can be lots of things. And it was, it was in those, it was like one of those moments where I kind of did this major flashback back to when I was growing up. And again, the environment that you live in and that you kind of soak up every single day, that's just the way it is. Um, I was seeing it in them, and that was super cool because they do think that I can pick in whatever I want. And I don't have to pick that thing and be that thing for the rest of my life. And I hope you, again, those of you who are students here understand that your days here, even though there's high levels of stress through midterms and all those kinds of things, juggling all the different parts of your life, um, if you can just pause every once in a while and really just take a bit of a step back and look and see you know, what is this class trying to teach me or what is this prof trying to teach me or this group assignment that I have with the one person that is doing no work because I know we've all been through it, right? <laughs> Where you have that one person in your group that's just like, yeah. Those are, all, those are all really important lessons. This is what it's led to. So I started teaching out of my home in 2008 and it was just for my friends and family. Jason got like six or seven of his buddies including Julian Demke that's here today. And they started coming to our basement to do Pilates twice a week, four classes. That's what I taught. I was doing my HR consulting upstairs in the basement. We would turn it into our studio at night. Within about 14 months, four classes became 16 classes. Um, that fall, we sold our grain and we b invested in some Pilates equipment. And you know what, you guys, by the fall of 2010, it was really evident that it was not a home-based business anymore. Our neighbors would tease us that they were going to start charging parking on their, <laughs> on their cement pads because our street was busy every single night. And um, Jason said to me one night, you know, Jana, this has gone beyond your hobby. And there's a legitimate business here. And people need what you're doing. That's the biggest thing is people need what you're doing. So you've got you to get out of the basement. <laughs> 
<laughs> and you gotta, we got to find you a space. And we did. And between June 2008 and September 2008, we renovated our first space, 2,200 square feet on Taylor Street, and that became Lead Pilates. I also knew that if I was going to succeed, I needed to be able to teach, to have instructors, right? My HR plan is based on who can teach, and I knew I couldn't teach forever. Um, so I went and invested in myself, and I went and got trained as a master instructor. So I knew that at least... Saskatoon is not a hotbed for Pilates instructors, um, and I needed to be able to train, and so that's what I did. And so here's this picture from the Star Phoenix, the business section. Uh, September of 2010, that's when we opened our doors, four instructors and me, and really having, well, no, I shouldn't say not having, I had an idea of what I was doing, kind of, but you kind of make it up. I've had some amazing experiences over the past, well, tw almost 12 years now. Um, I... Do you like my anatomy leggings? Look at those muscles. I love, yeah, so I'm teaching anatomy again this weekend, so I gotta pull those leggings out. These are pictures from our, from our original studio. We got to do some really cool things. We've been doing a Pilates retreat to Mexico where we take clients with us. Um, and you know what, you guys, the business built and built and built, and it slowly, uh, again, Jason had the conversation. He said, you know, Jana, we probably it's time to start looking for a bigger space. And, and in that moment, I started thinking, what would it be? What, what else could lead be? And I knew that clients that were coming to see me were gaining success because they were also being referred out to chiropractic or massage or physiotherapist. So my thought was, what if I could find people in this city that had the same perspective on health and wellness as I did, that realized that you didn't always need a diagnosis or empowering someone to realize that their, their, their headaches or their back pain doesn't always need a prescription to become a different situation. Where you could, with good information and education, take some of that control back and realize that it, it is very much about what we're putting into our body and how we're sitting and you know, we're hearing things like you know, sitting is a new smoking. We're hearing all those kinds of things, but we don't just wave the white flag. Because the success of a business, success of you as a person, is only determined by you know, your, your health and wellness, really, at the end of the day. So this was kind of where we all started. Um, fast forward five years, I found those people. I started finding people that wanted to join me. Amazing chiropractors, amazing administrative staff, massage therapists. And don't get me wrong, there have been bumps in the road. Some are pretty big. Um, but that was our grand opening at our space in Sutherland. Um, I've been able to teach to hundreds of people and share kind of my love for movement. I've had some amazing opportunities. Um, we've been published in the International Journal of MS. Um, you know, having your kids involved in sports is amazing. So one of the hockey moms that I know, um, who is the former CEO of the MS Society of, of Saskatchewan and Manitoba, we had lunch at Earl's one day, and she said to me, you know, Jana, there is a grant that I think you should apply for. You got to get your proposal in really quick. But uh, we did. So Jason and I sat down, and we wrote a proposal around Pilates and MS because there had been nothing done in that realm at all. And um, we got selected to move on to the second round of consideration. And within about four weeks, we got a call that we had funding, but we needed a research institution to partner with. Um, Within about 24 hours after that, we had six researchers from the College of Kinesiology and a researcher from the College of Pharmacy and Nutrition on board, and away we went. So um, where is that photo? I want to show you this photo. So there is our study. I was able to actually present at the Pilates Method Alliance Conference, which was, again, one, another dream of mine when I was there. I was like, I'm going to be on that research panel one day. And in the fall of 2017, I was. I was presenting our research. It had been published. There was statistical significance. It was amazing. I wanted to share this picture with you on the right. So we had 30 participants, all with an MS diagnosis. All 30 did uh, massage. That was our control. So they did one massage over 12 weeks each week. The experimental group did two Pilates classes with us each week. And you guys, besides the numbers, and I mean, there's researchers in this room, and numbers, you live and die by those numbers. Numbers were important, yes. But you know what was more important was that she's out in this photo here. But we had one of our participants, her goal, she said to me, Jana, I just want to walk down the aisle at my wedding without my walking aid. 
And you know what, you guys? She walked down the aisle at her wedding without her walking aid. And it was amazing. There were people that were able to drive. Um, one of our participants one day in March, she said, I want to introduce you to someone. So oh, we went to the parking lot. I thought there was one of her family members in a vehicle, and it was her candy apple red Mustang convertible that she had not driven for nine months because she didn't have the confidence in her body that it would work for her, and she was driving again. So those are the kinds of things that I have had the amazing opportunity to be a part of because I found something that I fell in love with, and I want everybody else to fall in love with it too. This is our clinic. So we do, we have an amazing team. You guys, I've got 47 people on my team right now and I love them each to pieces. We have chiropractic, naturopathic medicine, massage, Reiki, reflexology. We have mental health services, pre and postnatal doula services, nutrition services. Um, it is just a complete integration with the movement at the Pilates side that I feel like every single person that walks through our door leaves being a better version of themselves. And that feels pretty good to wake up every morning. And it really doesn't feel like work, even on those really, really tough days. Um, I had a woman come up to me. I was changing clothes on a mannequin between Christmas and New Year's, and she r came upstairs, and I thought she was just going up to her class. And she just, like, grabbed me and, like, squeezed me. And, I was, and then I realized she was crying. And I said, Vicki, are you okay? And she said, Jana, I just, this, is, this place has changed my life. It, I don't know where I would be had I not walked through your door um, a year ago. And it was pretty, it's, 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 again, pretty heartwarming to know that you're making that much of an impact in someone's life. Here are just a few pictures of our studio. Yeah, so there's my home away from home. Our little mantra, love the life you lead, because we really all should love it. Okay, we only got, we only got one we're only on this merry-go-round one time. We've got to make it worth it. This is, my, this is my gang. So we're missing about 13 people here. We do hire men. I, I had one business. I had one lunch with a, uh, one, uh, one of the, um, it was from the Sutherland Business Improvement District. Um, and he said to me, I've been on your website. And I'm just wondering if your business model is that you only hire women. And I said, no, I don't. <laughs> like, I, we love to have men on the team. But we do have 47, and there's three guys. So, um, there's powerful, powerful women that come to work on my team every single day. So what's next? Um, I had clients for years and years, my snowbird clients would say to me, Jana, could you please make a DVD? Could you make an app? Could you, we want to take you with us when, you, when we go away. And um, last May, people in my circles know that I've been talking about this online studio for years and years and years. And, Trista and I were on the phone with one of our business coaches, and, and um, they both said to me, like, what are, you, what are you waiting for? We are sick and tired of hearing that one day there is going to be this online studio. And it was one of those moments where it kind of like was, okay, Johnny, you got to put your money where your mouth is. And in September, we launched our online studio. So it's called the Meta District. There's people from all over the world that are, you know, purchasing the programs that I have out there. We've been getting amazing feedback, testimonials, people that are getting movement back, you know, their quality of life back. And that's what's cool because the Saskatoon area has had the opportunity for many, many years. And now to have the reach go literally around the world is really cool. Um, my podcast is launching next month. It's supposed to be this month, but it's going to be next month. Um, and you know what? One of my other little wish list goals is uh, I just got the mock up yesterday. And so we're being featured. Plotty Style Magazine is like a worldwide, um, it's kind of like the industry leader magazine trade publication for Pilates. And the Meta District is being featured in next month's. Um, issue. So I am, I am thrilled in those days where you feel like you're just not moving forward. There are moments where there's this glimpse of, yeah, I am. And so I want to leave you with four really key points and really finding your passion. And how do you find your passion? As a student, how do you find your passion? I know what wasn't my passion, wheat midge and computer science. I knew that. So you need to find your passion through experiences. It really comes down to that. So, so many of the opportunities you have through the university and the college, even just with different clubs, Opportunities to study abroad, that's how you find your passion, by doing, by exploring, by being. Find your people, all right? Um, these are the people that are going to pick you up and dust you off because you're going to fall, and sometimes you get pretty scraped up. Um, I didn't think that this was going to become a thing for me. It wasn't in my 10-year plan. But in the cr Christmas of 2008, when I'd just been teaching Pilates on the mat for four months, 
I started opening my birthday presents and my Christmas presents, and there was all these puzzle pieces, and I could tell there was a homemade puzzle, and so Jason rallied the troops. He got my parents and his parents, and everybody was pitched in some money, and I was putting together these puzzle pieces, and there was all this different Pilates equipment, and when you have someone that believes in you kind of more than you believe in yourself, it gives you a kick in the butt every once in a while, and that's really what he's been for me. He makes me see things in ways that I don't, or in ways that, like when I saw at the beginning when I walked in and I saw all the former people that have been up here, there was that little moment of, okay, I'm not in this arena yet. I, my, my picture shouldn't be up there with the likes of those amazing entrepreneurs. But it is, and I need to get comfortable with that. Um, so find your people. Your people are always going to be there for you. And like I said, you'll fail. Um, there will be moments, and don't get me wrong, there have been moments. So Jason and I actually had four partners that were going to be on board with us as we made the transition. And if you guys know business theory, right, you know that when you make a jump four times an original business, it's almost like you're starting from scratch, right? So you're no longer that mature business. You're kind of starting from scratch. We grew four times in square footage. We also took on four times the debt. And when you have partners, it kind of spreads that debt out. But over kind of a six-month period, those partners stepped away. And Jason and I were left with this really big bag of debt. And um, we are working our way through it. But there are those moments. like we, there, I remember the night we looked at each other, and I was like, we're too far down this process to back out. And he's like, Jan, we got this. We got this, okay? At the end of the day, if we fall flat, we're still very well educated. We can go out there and we can get jobs. We'll be okay. And we'll learn. And we did. Um, you know, there were days where I would drive up to make a bank deposit and my stomach would be turning and thinking, do I have to transfer money to be able to make payroll? Like all that stuff is a reality of an entrepreneur, okay? Um, and it just, you don't see that on an Instagram feed, <laughs> okay? There's a meme, you guys might have seen this meme, a day in the life of an entrepreneur. This is the best thing ever. Oh my God, I'm going bankrupt. Oh my God, you know, like it's all this, uh, this up and down. And, and it does sometimes happen in a day, not a week, but in a day. You go through this myriad of emotion um, and I mean, I often will call my sister. She owns her own business too, and I'm, she talks me off down off the ledge, and I talk her, to, right? It's just, it's just what you do. But at the end of the day, you love what you're doing, and I wouldn't trade it for the world. Um, so you will fail. And it would be remiss for me to not leave you with any sort of health and wellness message at the end. And so you know what, everyone? None of this matters. None of the presentation matters if you don't have your health. Joseph Pilates, I, two of my very favorite quotes, physical fitness can neither be achieved by wishful thinking nor outright purchase. And physical fitness is the first requisite of happiness. So even simply learning how to breathe properly, walking into an exam when you're like, I'm not sure how prepared I am, but your nervous system is so wound up. You know, being able to just know that you have that little tool in your toolbox or when you're going for an interview or having that crucial conversation or looking at a mark and seeing a 29 after you've handed in the rewrite from your 36. Um, knowing these little things really makes a huge difference. I wanted to share this with you. This is my Baba. So I took this video of my Baba and I, when she was 99, you guys, she just turned 101 on Sunday. So I think... This works. Hi everyone. So today I have a very special guest on my video blog. This is my Baba. She is 99 years young and so I thought who better to ask the question. If you could live to 99, what kinds of um, hints and tips or what choices would you make to ensure that you could live a long, healthy, prosperous life? So Baba, what what are some of your main lessons learned that have kind of brought you to 99 amazing years on this earth? Just being positive, making the best of each situation. Don't panic, don't stress, have faith. Really basic things, right? Basic. Basic just, things. Just don't cost you anything, just your your mind, your faith, and your feeling, and there you be have it. Kind to others, and others will be good to you. What I, can I say? I love it. Put That's... God first, and everything. Let things happen as they will, and deal with them as they come in the best way you can, and you'll always come on top. 
Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, you guys. So I wanted to share that because it's not very often, and I should have done another video now that she's a year and a half wiser than she was back then, right, in 2018. So this is, this is my crew. This is my why. This is why I want to do better every day. Um, that's my story. I hope there's something little that you can take with you um, about, my, about my journey. Everybody has a story. So it's just know that and know that it's time to create yours. Well, thank you, Jana, for those wonderful, stellar remarks, for including your baba like that. <laughs> it was a tear to my eye. That was wonderful. We have a few minutes for questions and comments from those who are in attendance today. So we'd ask that uh, there is a roving microphone. If you do have any questions for Jana that she could address at this time, right there in the front. Um, yeah, just in the journey of being an entrepreneur, um, I know you kind of touched briefly on it with, you know, financial struggles mm -hmm. and partners backing out, but yeah. I think you always go through those situations where you have doubts and you're wondering if you're on the right course. So um, what was kind of your mindset to help you get through those times and continue to push forward when it looked like everything was blowing up? Yeah, you know, we, um, we went to five different banks to get funding for our um, expansion. And you know what is a really tough pill to swallow? When you have two people that have been running a business for a while and they have a track record and you have this awesome young person <laughs> on the other side of the desk that kind of has your destiny in a way in their hands and they say to you in their 24-year-old voice, we don't think you have enough experience running a business. And so we're not really ready to take the risk on, you know, with you. And there were, there were moments we would walk out of a, a bank and just like look at each other and didn't know if we should laugh or we should cry. But I mean, you use the, the word, like the, the mindset, there are yucky, dark days sometimes, right? And sometimes there's days where you think, this switch has to change this month. Like, I'm not sure how things are going to happen or work out the next month. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it, it is mindset. It's also the people that you know. Like, one thing that I didn't touch on here was my very first boss at Yankee, Charlotte Rochon. When I left Koenig & Associates to go out on my own, Charlotte was one of my people that I called right away. And within three days, she had work sent my way because I had that pre-established relationship. So don't ever forget about the people that you've been in those group situations with at school or have been worked for at a part-time job um, because they will come back to be a really important person in your life. So, you know, that's, again, th those are unavoidable, those financial operational, you know, days where you're not sure how things are going to go. Every entrepreneur has a story like that. Um, and I think it's what makes us, it's not just the minus 50 that makes us resilient as Saskatchewan entrepreneurs, it's those moments as well. Uh, what would you say is your biggest aha moment as an entrepreneur? Oh my gosh. Now I know what the celebrities feel like when they get those story or those questions and they're like, I don't even know how to answer that. My biggest aha moment, I honestly think it just goes back to believing in what you're doing. I mean, running a business means you're solving a problem for someone or you're building a better mousetrap of whatever is already existing. And, you know, those aha moments where you feel like, like when I walked in today and I was like, should my picture really be up there with everybody else? Do I have what it takes to share? Am I, am I smart enough? Did I have enough business experience to share? Those aha moments, it's, you know what, to name one, I think it's kind of remiss because they happen so often now. For me, I gain my confidence when I have clarity. And one of my business coaches told me that one time. When you have clarity about where you're going, you have confidence. And then conversely, when you have confidence, you're better able to work yourself through those really muddy times and you're like, what the hell am I even doing? Why am I doing going in this direction? Because there's been lots of pivots and lots of shifts for us. 
I tried to do like a Warman satellite studio that lasted about you know six months. We did cycling at Lead because we want we thought we we wanted to be a little bit more mainstream. There's times where you get distracted as an entrepreneur, and it's those aha moments I think that bring you back to okay, what am I really good at? Why did I start doing what I'm doing? And coming back to the basics is a really important lesson that I that I think I continually learn. Time for one more down in the front. Yes. <gasps> Who is your who is your mentor? What are you learning right now? What am I learn who is my mentor? You know, I have started so I did some business programming. My sister and I used to go to Toronto kind of every month for a business um, coaching program, which I loved going and being in front of other people that own businesses. But you know what? Right now I'm starting to do more online business mentorship and I'm part of a really cool mastermind on thir every second Thursday. Um, I meet with people all over the world that run businesses and we get together for an hour and a half and we share information, we learn a lot from each other. So I think that's what I'm finding is really cool now is that I'm getting to connect with business people all over the world that I never would have had a chance to. Um, so, and, I, and my, the book I'm reading right now that I'm really loving is a book called Thrive by Ariana Huffington. And it's a very, very good book. Uh, so I like to read about I like to read about business, and I like to read about successful business people, um, because you know what, their successes also talk a little bit about where they had some struggle. Yeah, that's what I'm doing right now. Thanks for your question. Well, I think in terms of reading about successful business people, we could just read about you <laughs> because you've done tremendous in your capacity. Uh, we'll wrap it up here. I know we have a presentation uh, from Gord, but two things I'll say quickly. I applaud you for being an HR major. <laughs> um, I got 27% oh. on my first HR midterm when I was an undergrad, so kudos to you. And what would you say if Melody Dredge were here tonight? What oh, would you well. say to her? <laughs> I, would thank you. I would thank her for being a very good competitor. Um, and I would say, look at me now, Melody Dredge. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Jen. We'll bring up Gordon now for All presentation. All right. Okay. Sorry. Great. Well, yeah, I'll just, this is just a quick. My wife has written three books, and two are about uh, my misspent youth and why I'm entrepreneurial. And this is an original painting from the book. And once you read the story, and if you link it back to my introduction and pain, it'll make sense. <laughs> To you, and we'll get better shots next time. But uh, I'm holding my buns, and you have to read. <laughs> it kind of grabs your attention, doesn't it? Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Maureen. Thank you so much, you guys. Thank you. And Thank you.